So uh, thank you very much, Loa, for a kind introduction. And um, my thanks to Tina and all the other people who organized um, this wonderful um, series of papers. I hope mine is not a deviation from this level of wonderfulness. But um, I, I do need to make one thing really, really clear. I'm one humble person among two towering scholars in a project that we're just beginning. Um, Ricardo Agursi, of course, is the one who excavated things that I want to show you in just a, a few minutes. And Carl Tauby is going to be doing the iconographic interpretations. I'm going to take some kind of naive stabs at that. Do not expect anything sophisticated in that domain. Uh, and in fact, as we're talking about the 99 versus the 1, here I am dealing with like a upper part of the 1, um, but I, my background and real commitment in research is to the 99%. I've been working, um, as Lois said, <clears throat> at the Seren site um, where we have um, a nice clear window on the... Uh, commoners, the 99%. But I think I can work a little bit of them in. I want to, I think I can um, do that. But, okay, now, with a title like this, Eccentrics, I could be talking about colleagues of mine. <laughs> and as tempting as that is, I, I won't do that. Um, I could talk about professors I've had. Um, and if we're talking about eccentric in the British sense of the term, I, I think it's very appropriate for, for people who have very high scholarly achievement um, but are very much willing to go not just in the comfortable mainstream but to forge off in new kinds of directions. So, no, I'm actually talking about some artifacts. Um, we'll start here um, with some eccentrics. The, the usual term we use is eccentric flints. Um, I used that term a long time ago um, until I found out that actually they're not flint, they're chert. Um, and so I, I just, I can't use the term eccentric flint um, because they are chert. So I'm sorry about that. I, I will just call them eccentrics. That term is really not very good. Um, when we analyze lithics, I think we're quite good about identifying arrowheads, spear points, knives, scrapers, drills, um, prismatic blades, a whole series of lithic implements. But what we do, and this actually started in 1918 in Belize, um, study of artifacts, um, comfortably categorizing a number of those, but then there are these forms that we just really don't know. We could have called them, damn if I know, um, we could call them, we could shrug, we could have used a whole lot of terms. The term eccentric has stuck, and so I'll just not use um, flint, but I, I'll, I'll say, okay, eccentric is all right, we'll deal with that. It, it, Eccentric is an adjective. I'll kind of transmogrify it into a, a noun and um, go on with that. So, um, starting with Bill Coe, my dissertation advisor, um, Bill started out with his dissertation work. Maybe a lot of people don't know this actually in, in El Salvador at Chalchuapa. Did really good excavations. We know how good he was about documentation in all senses, photographic and drawing and things like that. In fact, one time when I was drawing a mound, I sloped my ground, sin signal, ground symbols um, so that the center element was perpendicular to the ground surface. And boy, did I learn you don't slope your ground symbols. And so I have never done that again. I mean, just really, really high standards for um, for documentation, and I, I hope to come up to his standard someday. I better do it pretty quick. Um, but <laughs> anyway, so um, here are some. Um, due to a change in government, he couldn't ship out um, the artifacts, and so they stayed in El Salvador. 
Um, he went to Piedras Negras and did excellent work there. And so here we've got a number of eccentrics. Um, a very common form is this, um, various sizes. We can see um, here's another similar one. These two are quite similar. You can start to see there are some commonalities. Um, but how do these function? They could have been used in a whole lot of different ways. Um, and I'm not even going to go into speculation right now, but actually Bill found some eccentrics in Chalchihuapa, but didn't, of course, have time to actually do anything with them. So he took his eccentric plunge um, at PN, and then, of course, in a huge way, um, we all know at Tikal. These come from all different time periods, and he's got them arranged somewhat by form. Most eccentric, I would, actually, a bunch of these are on display just upstairs. So if you want to see one in real time, um, that's where you can see some. Uh, I went up there and checked just a little while ago. So um, unless they've been removed in the last half hour, um, they're there. And I do suggest you take a look. Very recently, somewhere in Guatemala, and I haven't, I haven't been able to find out where, somewhere in Guatemala, um, a cache, a single time period from a single person um, was looted. And there's right now a battle. These are the ones that were um, dug up by a looter. They fell into the hands temporarily of an architect in Guatemala City who's trying to keep them inside the country. And here is part of his effort to do that. About the only value here, since we don't know anything about context, um, is that these have enough similarity that those of us who do stone tool manufacture can say comfortably these were made by one person at a certain point of time in his or her training and experience period. Now, I do use him and her um, here because I teach a class in stone tool manufacture. We do theory. We do <sighs> apply uh, well various um, aspects of stress and fracture and things like that. And then in the last five weeks is why really students sign up for it. We actually do manufacture of stone tools. And I get all my students through Old Awan into Lower Paleolithic. Um, and in fact, actually, we just started on Lower Paleolithic on, on Thursday. Um, and then next week, on Tuesday, I get back. I'm going to try to get some of them into Middle Paleolithic. And so I've got a pretty good sense as to how much training um, is necessary to get to a, a certain point. Um, and I don't think any of them will get to this point, but um, some of them could easily get up to, to some of these um, simpler um, kind of forms by the end of the, this month, end of the semester. Now, um, one reason why I w don't want to give the idea that only males made this is that, that there's a... I, I teach this class every year, or at least every other year, and my female um, students generally do better than the male students just because, especially with freehand percussion, when you've got a, a rock here and a hammer stone, um, they have a little bit better hand-eye coordination than the, the males. I hope to sound sexist, but I've been doing it long enough. It's a pretty, fairly consistent pattern um, because the point of impact, the amount of force, how big the hammerstone, and the a bunch of features of the rock, the, the core that you're working on. Um, if you make a, an error of, say, a couple of millimeters or, say, five degrees in the angle of, of force, um, you're not going to get what you want. Um, so one can identify um, these kinds of abilities and trainings in um, in these um, in these lithics, the working beyond the cache, I want to s mention some things about sacred bundles. Um, there's a really good publication that came out a few years ago, um, um, published in in North Carolina on sacred bundles, edited volume. 
beginning with Olmec and Maya and, and um, uh, Highland Mexican um, sacred bundling of the idea, the basic core idea, well, actually, sacred bundling is, is, um, was done in the ancient past and is still done very actively um, all the way up into the northern plains of the U.S. and up into Canada. Um, and they share some general characteristics of um, a, containing objects that contribute their interactive capabilities, items in a bundle. Um, the whole is greater than the sum of the individual parts, uh, but the individual parts have power, they have agency, they have object agency, and their combination um, can go towards a particular goal. The goals, bundles, individual bundles can have different kinds of goals for different purposes, and ha, here's my 99% kind of slipping in here. Um, we at the Seren site, we excavated a building that was just built for divination, um, a diviner, a shaman, um, female, I'm quite sure, um, had a bundle of items that I think are very much like diviners in training do now as when they have a particularly strong encounter with the supernatural domain, um, they will pick up an item that catches their eye at that location. It's often a discarded prismatic blade up in, say, Santiago, Atitlan, um, and put that in their bundle, the, maybe a figurine head or a crystal or something like that. And so they develop a supernatural um, contact toolkit um, through their training and then keep doing that. So the 99% do it, um, but we're really focusing more on the 1%, um, <clears throat> the elite, Yashilan, um, a royal woman, um, carrying a bundle that will be um, given to someone else. So the sacred bundles, super, super important, and I think that there are some implications um, for particular caches and maybe implications for this wonderful, wonderful cache um, that Ricardo Agurcia um, excavated at, um, at Copan. Now, the bundles, um, uh, I think we tend to focus on what's inside the bundles and we miss the importance stated in a number of ways by people that are making these, doing these, maintaining these, that the wrapping of the bundle has a tremendous amount of power itself. And here, there tends to be a pretty strong gender factor here in the, the um, weaving, making thread, um, and weaving is very strongly associated with women, and the woman's role in then making the cloth, I think, is a very important part of this. Does that mean that women have nothing to do with the manufacture? I don't think so. Um, but the, the the weaving, to me at least, is a fairly strong um, gender association. Now, the bundles, OK, in Santiago Atitlan now, um, bundles are kept out of sight, out of um, functioning. Um, until their time is due, things, uh, bundles can often be used, um, continue to be wrapped, or sometimes unwrapped. Here in the Codex Borgia, look what happens when a bundle is unwrapped. Look at the supernatural power, um, agency, authority. I mean, this is, I, I, I don't, I was going to say that this is a, the supernatural version of what those idiots did to the, the Boston Marathon. This is almost an explosion of, of supernatural connectivity. Um, and I'd say pretty dramatic. Here we're seeing their view, Codex Borgia um, from Highland, Mexico, Puebla. Um, and then here just a, a, actually not a very good drawing bundle um, in the in the Maya area. So um, bundles are, are targeted. 
Um, let's move to, I guess I don't need to point out about Copan. I want to thank all my earlier um, presenters here for setting things up um, pretty well for me, so I don't need to go through much in terms of basics. So, at any rate, um, Seren, Seren site down here, um, Chalchuapa, where Bill Coe and then, then Bob Scherer went. And I do want to say I very much appreciate the training that Bob Scherer gave me at Chalchuapa. He finished off what Bill Coe started and then did it much more so. So I, I do appreciate more than two cartoons of work with um, and knowledge and association learning from um, Bob Scherer. So I, in a way, his um, spirit is um, still very much with us. So a uh, view of Copan almost two centuries ago, um, Catherine Wood's wonderful, wonderful um, illustrations um, done with that camarade Lucy, though. So he's actually portraying things not romanticized, um, but as, as they actually were. So, Ricardo Garcia then um, started a tunnel doing his arthroscopic work instead of doing the, the uh, kind of mega trench in the um, plaza at, at Tikal, um, doing this, this wonderful exploration of an absolutely extraordinary um, building, of course, Rosalila. Um, I think all of us are quite familiar with this. The, the uh, ancestral, the theme um, of the Maya weekend, um, reverential construction, reconstruction, the reconstruction of, of um, shrines, temples, pyramids um, from Kenich Yashkut Mo down below up to this Fabulous, fabulous structure. There, there, there's really nothing else like it. Um, and fortunately, the original maintain, is maintained in, in um, extraordinarily good condition. So Rosa Lila was built um, about 570, 571, um, under ruler number 10, um, Sik Balam otherwise known as Moon Jaguar. How long it took, I don't think there's evidence on any direct evidence of it. I, I would guess it took a few years. It did take about three years to build the replica um, of it um, that'll show in a, in a bit here. So is that a rough kind of indicator? It, it certainly was not built um, all at once. I think the red painting, I agree with the suggestion um, that the red painting um, is a um, activating agent um, symbolic of the chutlel that's in the human blood. Um, it is a structure with, with um, tremendous supernatural power um, and wonderful decoration. Of course, many things refer to the the um, Yash Kukmo and Sun God um, functionally burning Kopal incense um, and smoke coming out at the top. It is a locus of powerful communication um, with the supernatural domain. And I think a, a responsibility, there's a burden, um, a responsibility here of um, a king, um, a royal um, to stand here and have the responsibility of getting the rain to come, nurture the crops, um, have, a, have sustenance um, for um, society. Uh, the, here is a picture um, Ricardo um, took me and a few other people on a tour of the tunnels, and here he is with a properly reverential um, view um, looking up. Um, and the um, replica, this is a, how many people have been to the sculpture museum? I mean, I want to see how many, yeah, okay. 
So those of you who haven't, hey, it's your own fault. You've got to go there. <laughs> you, 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 it's wonderfully designed so that there's a big berm that's grassed, and you really don't get a sense of a very big building there. What you do see um, is the open jaws of the um, earth deity that you walk through, and then there's this dark tunnel, and so you are being digested. And then you come out, and pow, here it is in the sun in the atrium, one-to-one -one scale, gorgeously painted. And so I don't want to hear excuses. Um, just got to have that. I don't know of any other museum that has such a powerful effect on people. Rarely do you see someone kind of walk in and say, oh, well, hmm, geez. So at any rate, here I took this picture while it was being built um, and the tremendous amount of thick stucco that then um, was painted in the red here, a doorway. Um, and at this point, the um, upper portions had yet to be built. So this took about um, three years. And the net result is here's what you see when you walk through. Um, sculpture um, displayed and, and uh, explained throughout the signage is excellent. I wish that they didn't um, sell tickets separately to the, the Sculpture Museum and the park, because a lot of people are now not going to here, just going into the open area. Um, but unforgettable, absolutely unforgettable. So I feel extremely fortunate um, to have been asked into this um, group with Ricardo and Carl Tavi to work on the lithics um, that were found on the floor in a wrapped, they were bundled, they were wrapped in very fine cotton gauze thread um, placed on the floor in a, with a series of rocks around that looked kind of like a, a, a fire pit and then placed very carefully um, facing a, a particular direction. Um, and the other, other elements of the cache, and I, I'm going to focus on the lithics, but there are other elements that, are, that give reference to the stingray spines to the ocean and flowers and the celestial realm or what have you. The, Ricardo's going to be um, writing uh, <clears throat> about the overall all context. But So what I'm trying to do is a technical analysis of the lithic. So here are some, um, and I'll, let's look at those more closely. Um, but first, the cache, as it was being excavated, I cannot imagine a more exciting situation. Most, almost all, well, okay, I need to do, need to do one thing right now before going any farther. I showed you what I would call general eccentrics to begin with, um, the kind of forms that, that are fairly small, some kind of simple, some fairly complex, but we just really don't know um, what the, why people made them. Um, but um, these effigy eccentrics are in a class of their own. There's a human face, um, nose, um, mouth, lips, hand. Um, there's always a principal figure and some um, secondary profiles um, in them. The, so going back to the actual excavation, and then I want to at least attempt um, some kind of general iconography, religious interpretation. Um, but here is one being removed from the cache, and the cache about to be discovered, and then um, here they are. Here's a, here's a big biface. I'll show you this one in a moment. And then there are nine of these effigy eccentrics here, other elements of it down below. And this just kind of looks to me like a, a fire pit. And fire is an element um, that, of course, was, was, was figures very heavily in Maya thought. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that in, in um, just a moment. 
So um, those photographs of the, um, those last five pictures were provided um, to, be, to me by um, Ricardo with impeccable timing in my last two minutes before leaving my office in Colorado. Um, I got an email, um, just about to turn my computer off, and I heard bling, and I thought, oh, well, okay, I'll see the last email, um, and those were attached to it, so I very much appreciate um, being able to, to show those. So here's a picture I took um, of this one big biface. It is this long, and it is this thin. I would need to train myself for years to be able to do that, and I'm not sure if I'd ever be able to really be successful. This is impressive to get this crisp of an edge. I've looked all along those edges macroscopically and microscopically. There's no evidence of use, and I don't think you'd want to use it on anything. It is so thin and so gorgeous. Um, so. I think it was made right to be put in here specifically for this cache. It was painted red. I think from the hue, I'm pretty confident that that's um, mercuric sulfide, cin cinnabar. Um, but it, I, uh, I don't have a chemical analysis of it. And you can see some remnants of the cloth um, that it was wrapped in. It was bundled. Now, um, there was a, a question um, about the, the um, chert flakes that were found um, at La Corona. Um, and the um, chert flakes, by the, from the description, they were, they were not secondarily retouched. They were simply percussion flakes. That's what they looked like to me, and that's how they were described. They can have a pretty strong um, importance just as chert flakes. And how I want to get to that is by jumping up quite a bit into the, the pantheon of religion in that chalk, the storm deity, the rain god of the Maya, um, is a powerful deity, of course, having to do with creation, life, sustenance, nurturing, crop growth, plant growth, trees, um, keeping the world green and functioning um, for the Maya. And a way that chalk influences people and the earth um, is by lightning, sending lightning down. Um, the Maya in the Classic period, in the post-Classic, in colonial times, and still today believe that obsidian was created by lightning striking the ground. And to me, I think that's fairly logical because a really strong lightning strike um, striking, say, a sand sand on a beach, will fuse a bit of that into a rock. Right? Um, and over generations and generations, I think it's very likely they observed that and thought, OK, well then, other lightning strikes, maybe bigger, back in time immemorial, um, had struck and formed um, obsidian. Also, chert was formed by lightning. Lightning also catches trees on fire, catches pine trees on fire, and the Maya light pine torches. So there's a, a connection there. Um, when I did an analysis of the uh, chipped stone in the sacred cenote at Chichen, I noticed that all of the highland Mexican lithics are pretty easy to identify by material and by form. Um, were just placed in the cenote, um, tossed in, thrown in. Um, but the Maya lithics were burned and thrown in. At first I thought, well, this is kind of strange. Then I thought, oh, wait, well, they, they 
wanted to give them a reverential treatment by burning, and a lot of them broke, perhaps releasing a spirit of power um, from those. Um, certainly the figurines. Oh, here's another way I can do a 99%. Um, the figurines that we found at um, the lake, Lake Cuscachapa in Chalchuapa on Bob Scherer's project, 500 of those from a fairly small excavation about, oh, put it all together, about four meters by four meters, every one of those snapped at the neck, bodies um, thrown in separate from the heads and deposited there by um, the, the Maya. And I'm quite confident that was to release the spirit inside of it so it could go up into the, into the heavens and water ritual bring, bring the rains to come. It's actually a sacrilege, I think. I realize um, that we then eagerly glue them together every time we can. And so drought is archaeologists' fault. We have a responsibility here to, to uh, maybe unglue those. I don't know. But at any rate, um, so um, the, we've got a, a real association of, of chalk lightning. Well... And here I'm getting a little uncomfortable, um, but Kawil is, I think, the personification of that lightning. Um, Kawil is often depicted, you know, I need a better example. Okay, um, I, Kawil um, is often depicted, hey, do you see that little fly going by? It was showing the... Um, axe, the smoking axe, the fiery smoking axe um, on the forehead over and over again. Here's another one. See this the human face profile here? Here's the principal figure um, with the smoking axe. Now, how, how would an axe, is there a, a reason why they might associate an axe with lightning? Well, okay. An axe, most axes are hard greenstone to, uh, metamorphic, hard greenstone to jade. And an axe in use, if you accidentally hit a rock that has a little bit of iron um, hematite or magnetite or um, iron oxide in it, you'll get a spark. So maybe that association, as, as a, uh, that little microcosm, is, is symbolic of the macrocosm, um, but also um, jade as a hard stone um, was caused by lightning. Still today, if you go into traditional areas, um, the, you don't ask, um, but I, oh, I did this a few years ago when I was a beginning graduate student. I went into the Maya Highlands and I was asking um, Maya, uh, if there were any obsidian sources, I would say obsidiana. Um, get a blank kind of look. People would try to be helpful, but they didn't know what I was talking Piedra de Raya means lightning stone. Oh, see, I put a car, blah, blah, blah. Um, they still believe obsidian was created by lightning, and it makes a certain amount of sense. So, wheel then is. The personification of that, and I think what we've got um, is then that um, reference um, to Kawil right here. There might be, and I'm not sure about this, but I, I want this to work. Um, I also noticed as I'm analyzing these that there's this standard kind of notching that's going in all the way around that is straight in, perpendicular to the edge. Um, fairly easily done, but there is oblique notching, which is harder to do, coming in at a, about a 45 degree angle to the edge. And I, I noticed at the Copan Sculpture Museum that a, um, a zigzag, an offset zigzag with that same kind of um, oblique form um, is interpreted as, as lightning, as a symbol of lightning. And so 
if that's correct, I think they're doing this uh, on a very, very small scale. Actual size of, of these um, is about this long. These have been, this is a scan, digitized scan. This is a photograph, so it does convey some of the color. A scan, you lose the color, but the advantage is that it goes through the textile in most cases, and we can see the actual, actual flaking. The, um, and you know what, I think I'm going to reorganize right here and, and talk a little bit about the actual manufacturer um, because for me, these are just simply gorgeous and astounding, absolutely astounding. Um, the, before actually looking at them, I thought um, that they would be made from a large nodule of, of chert. And I kind of envisioned how that would be partitioned and large blades would be knocked off and they'd be secondarily flaked and shaped and things like that. Um, no way. No way. The, these, I am quite confident, are made from a very unusual kind of chert. Most chert in the Maya lowlands, Yucatan, Patan, Belize, whatever, comes in, in roughly rounded kind of, of nodules. Um, these came from a, an unusual kind of flint that is a, a tabular, flat flint. And they worked very, very hard to maintain a little bit of cortex. See a little white end right here? This is a little bit of cortex. This is calcium carbonate from the limestone matrix of the whole piece. It is not easy to maintain that at the bottom. It's very soft. And they worked very hard to have that stay there. It, it's easy to miss on, on these. You've got to really look for it. The scan, it won't show in the scans. Uh, scan won't pick it up. So only in, in photographs or with it right there in front of you. Um, Alex Toko Vinini did the scans. And boy, thank you, Alex. Because my analyzing these at Copan, um, I, I never touched them. Um, and I wanted to see flaking patterns, things like that. So, uh, if you believe me, they were made from tabular chert um, of a very, very high quality. Initially, I was thinking they might have been made from that really nice chert from northern Belize, but no. No, they're made from some more local source that has not been discovered. I would like to know where that is. I'd like to get my hands on some of that and at least try to replicate some of this. So the initial manufacture would have been to take a piece of um, tabular shirt um, quite a bit larger than what you see here. We'll say roughly rectangular form um, and maybe a little bit of freehand percussion. You check. You hear. Does it resonate? These would have made a very high plinging noise um, because they are structurally perfect all the way through. They must have discarded a lot because there are structural imperfections. The ones that are good, they could have done a little bit of freehand um, percussion, but not very much. The real key to manufacture is a humble little implement um, about as big as this pen that's used as a, what's called, a, well, it's a punch. It's called indirect percussion, where, and I better not actually do this, but where the, per, I'm going to poke a hole in the screen, but um, where the person, to, to take a flake off like this one, turn it over, or let's say take a flake off like this one, but on the other side, you put this exactly where you want that force to go, then with a possibly a hammerstone, but I would bet a hardwood billet um, because you're going to get a nicer kind of, of force um, stress on that piece to tap. You've got the angle and the point precise. So now the third factor is the amount of force and ping, you get a flake off. So tremendous amount of, of flaking 
um, effort in, in manufacture. This, um, by the way, this is, these are two views of the same object. I, I should have pointed that out first. We have some estimates about the amount of time that it would take a really, really accomplished maestro, although that indicates male, or maestra, um, to really manufacture one of these at least a dozen hours or so, and my guess is more like 15 to 20. Um, probably not more than about 20 hours necessary to make one of these. How many they broke, I don't know. I'd love to know what they did with the broken ones. Um, I've, I've never seen them show up. I wonder if they just really smashed those to smithereens that we've not been able to, to uh, identify. So um, after manufacture, then um, painted and wrapped. I'll show you some pictures I took on the microscope of, of, the, of the textile. Um, and another. Another thing, I've been calling these scepters. In the literature, they're called scepters. The idea um, is that then a king would hold this in a ceremony, say, of investiture. <coughs> um, Kawil is a, 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 a um, deity of divine kingship, of rulership. And this could be kingship and kinship. Um, with the, I suggest, um, with the profile of the living ruler, with Kawil, um, and then a deceased ancestor with um, his, I guess, his Kawil, and the lightning here um, associated with that one, lightning um, symbol um, perhaps associated here. An uh, article, brief article, just published um, last year from the Dumbarton Oaks volume on Maya art um, challenges that. And so I had that very much in mind. Could I see any evidence of this being used, taken out, um, hafted maybe? I saw on all nine of these, no evidence of haft wear and no evidence of use, the polishing that comes from moving, taking out putting back. Um, I uh, did not see any evidence of that. The edges are crisp, and the manufacturer, I, I'm pretty confident of this, that six out of the nine were made by the same person who is the principal figure in the church workshop. In fact, well, <clears throat> I think I can identify even three people in the church workshop. So, the <clears throat> let me identify two of them. One I've already said, El Maestro. What I would really like to know, and I just don't know, I've speculated and thought and wondered about this, to actually successfully make this, the bottom side where the flake is going to be taken off has to be stabilized by something. And I don't know what. Maybe on um, layers of deer, hide, um, other materials, mats, I don't think would do it. It needs to be a, 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 a continuous stabilization um, with someone holding it also. A little bit too much force, <clears throat> and things could snap. The, a very fragile portion would be here. This could snap easily um, with a little bit too much force up in this area. Um, too much force along any of it can have what we call end shock, where you've got two, with the impact, you've actually got two components of force, um, a P wave, which travels twice as fast as the S wave. And if a P wave and S wave interact and hit each other, um, you can snap a piece that we call end shock. So the stabilization has got to be done separate. That's another person stabilizing this <clears throat> while the expert is doing the indirect percussion with the, with the punch. So there are two people working on this. The, the, 
the person who's stabilizing is not as sophisticated in manufacture, but is really smart about how to actually stabilize the piece. And I, I just don't know. Um, I have no evidence of how that was actually done. So the, the apprentice I'll get to in a, in a few minutes, but let's look at some more of these. Here are a couple more scans. Um, the scan does not get through all of the added <coughs> materials, but you can make out um, the overall um, situation of the principal figure um, with forehead, Maya standard of beauty, um, with the continuous nose and forehead, cranial um, deformation, wheel, um, smoking, flaming axe, um, and the hand coming up, even a little bit of, uh, of fingers. Um, seated, I think, leg here, and here's our oblique flaking, I think, symbolizing lightning, and then the perpendicular regular kind of flaking, I think, symbolizing um, feathers. This, I've tried um, flaking a hole in something. That hole wasn't there to begin with, and it is really, really difficult um, to do. I, I, if I had to try to do this, the first thing I would do would be to do a cone fracture. You, you've all seen a, maybe you've actually done it, a, a BB um, hitting a, a glass window and knocking out that little cone. Um, I, if I had a, a slab of this shirt, I would do that first and get through a few failures before I finally got a hole. Um, and then I would do the rest of the flaking. But look, this is almost another um, complete cavity here. This is impressive. Um, we've got a, a um, principal figure with the hand coming up a bit. Um, another one here with a, a, an arm coming out. Um, another uh, smoking axe. Um, a figure here. Uh, I think there may be another one under here. Um, and then a, another um, figure back here. So I'm not, con I, I don't think, I don't see any evidence that they were actual scepters that were used. I think there's a very, I think it's more likely that these, all nine of these, plus the three bifaces, the real big biface and two other smaller ones, were made right from the beginning with the idea that they were going into that cash, special cash deposit. The um, two others, um, a um, principal um, figure here, the face um, quite accentuated, um, nose, mouth, lips. Um, another figure here, I think maybe lightning um, symbol uh, coming down here. Um, and look at the curvature on this. A wheel is often depicted in art um, as having a human leg and then a other leg that starts human and is changed into a serpent body and, and, and serpent mouth. Um, is this, in a sense, um, something like uh, Trish McEnany was talking about in terms of of folded time, um, if this is a depiction profile of the ruler at that particular time, um, this could be a reference to the symbol of divine authority, the wheel of the immediate deceased ancestor and then an earlier ancestor. I don't know. Um, and another thing I'm not convinced about is, is, is this just a reference to the present and then the immediate and then further back past? I think that this cash may be more than out of sight, out of mind. Um, I think it might be focused also on then the future of saying, okay, yes, we are decommissioning de-ensouling Rosalila, um, but we are also getting it ready for the next um, ruler, the next stage, the next um, continuity. So um, here's a couple pictures um, of some of the thread that I did 
uh, pictures of the, <coughs> of the thread through the microscope. This is actually showing just a little teeny, teeny area. Um, and here are two more done by El Maestro. Um, and a close-up of this gorgeous thread, um, cotton thread, gauze, colored with the Maya blue. And, but look at these. Now, I'm going to show you three um, of these um, eccentrics that are, were made by the apprentice. This is not El Maestro. This is someone who's extremely skilled, very adept. But look at the, the, the flaking is very different, control of surfaces, very different. Um, the Two of the three have two back elements here. I think there was one here that was broken. See, I'll look at this next one. Um, see, there are two back elements, and this one is missing. And I see I'm taking too much time. I don't want to get in people's way for lunch, but uh, let me just finish off here. I, I get a little excited about this, and I'm sorry. Um, but the, finally, to, to this is a photograph that I, I took. Um, just to finish off, there is one other cache of eccentrics associated with the hieroglyphic stairway. And here, National Geographic um, reconstruction. Here's a, a, a rough picture of those three. About 100 years later, um, stylistic conventions have changed a bit so that there's an outside kind of circular form, but a principal figure and then other profiles. Um, I think they tried to do the same thing here, um, snapped it, and then so they just finish that off. So my final shot, just replacing, uh, just repeating those is, this is impressive. And so I just very much appreciate being a part of an early project. You will see a publication on this, but my part is a very small part of it. And um, how about a hand for Ricardo Garcia and his excavations in getting us this. <laughs> Thank you very much.